Well, tonight, after 10 months or so uh, working our way through uh, the book of Revelation, we come to the passage that, generally speaking, um, everyone wants to talk about. And, uh, and everybody hopes that we sort of um, skip to this one when we start at the beginning. And uh, in many ways, this is the chapter that many people think about when they think about the book of Revelation. A thousand years, the millennium. That's, uh, that's what we're talking about tonight. And I've said before that, um, that we'll all get to heaven one day and realize that we were wrong about some things. All of us are wrong about some things. Uh, We don't realize we're wrong about them, because if we realize we were wrong, we'd believe something else. But we're all wrong about some things. And I'm sure that there will be things that I'll find out that I'm wrong about, and I'll be surprised to find out that I was wrong about them. Um, And then there are other things that it won't particularly surprise me if I find out that I'm wrong about them. Uh, And so... uh, some of these questions that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, particularly around um, exactly when and for how long and, 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 and what, uh, what precisely the millennium will look like and stuff like that, all of these things are in the second category for me. Um, if I get to heaven and find out I'm wrong, that's not going to surprise me all that much. Um, I'm going to do my best to teach what's here and to connect it to the rest of the Bible, Uh, But this is a notoriously difficult section of Scripture to interpret well. And one of the ways you can tell that is that within uh, within Bible-believing, conservative, committed Christian circles, there are just about as many different ways of reading it as there are people reading it. And so... um, and so, uh, and some of this is simply because interpreting symbols, interpreting prophecy, often involves equal parts science and art. Um, you bring the rest of the scriptures to bear, but there is still a significant amount of artistry in it compared to interpreting other kinds of literature in the scriptures. Um, so, what we'll do is we're gonna we're gonna read uh, we're gonna read our passage, and then we'll pray. And then I'll give an overview of the basic historical ways of interpreting this passage and applying it to our expectations. And then we'll break down what it appears to be saying about the reality of both our existence on earth now and our future as well. So that's the plan. Um, Let's go. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Let's pray. Lord, we pray as always that you would encourage us from your word, that we would learn truly, that I might speak truly, and that we might hear your revealed word, your revealed truth to us in your scripture. Give us heads that are ready to understand and help us to be encouraged to not see these things as 
uh, revelations that are far away from us, that have little to do with us, but help us to see them as having a very real impact, very real import for our lives and our calling in this place right here and right now. So Spirit, be with us and help us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we'll start with this, a, uh, a millennial overview, if you want to put it that way. Uh, that through the, through the history of the church, you get many different flavors within each of the schools, uh, but there have been three main schools of thought in, uh, in how to interpret these few verses, in, in order to interpret what the millennium is, what it is describing, okay? And the three basic categories are, you've probably heard the words before, but maybe aren't entirely sure what they mean. So we'll, we'll try to fill in the blanks a little bit tonight. The three basic schools are pre-millennialism, post-millennialism, and awe-millennialism. Um, so we'll, we'll take them in turn, okay? Pre-millennialism. Uh, as it sounds, it's talking about before the millennium. Specifically, it's saying that Jesus will return before the millennium begins, okay? that the return of Jesus is before the millennium. And there is a historical version of this school of thought that traces its way all the way back into the early church. This, this basic idea has been around for as long as there have been Christians. Okay? Uh, and the idea is that at some point in the future, Jesus will return and will establish a literal kingdom on earth prior to the renewal of all things. The dead in Christ will rise from their graves and reign with him. Jesus will reign for a thousand years, and there will be relative justice and peace. This is not the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, The world will still be imperfect, but it will be a future literal thousand-year reign on earth with significant peace, justice, and prosperity. And then comes the last judgment, okay? Names that you might recognize who hold to this historical premillennialism include people like Charles Spurgeon and James Montgomery Boyce and John Piper and Al Mohler and Francis Schaeffer, okay? Now, uh, over the last 200 years, a little, la little less than 200 years, there has been a version of this that is heavily influenced by dispensational theology, which is, which is something of a Johnny-come-lately on, uh, on the theological scene, okay, especially in the Western world, that sees a radical distinction between Israel and the church, sees them as two distinct separate entities, even saved in different ways, okay? Uh, more radical versions of it will say that Jews continue to be saved by the law, the church is saved by faith, and then Jesus will return secretly at some point in the future to, to rapture all Christians out of the world, to make all Christians disappear in a moment, okay? Then there will be a time of tribulation, and then Jesus will return with the church to make all things new, okay? So only those who are particularly steeped in dispensational theology, which is a relatively recent invention, believe this approach. But you might recognize names like Jerry Falwell, and Tim LaHaye, and John MacArthur, who are, who are in that camp, okay? That's premillennialism. There's the historical version, which could very well be right, okay? Uh, the dispensational version, I don't think quite so much, but the, the historical version could certainly be true. Post-millennialism, okay? Opposite of pre, post. So the return of Jesus is after the millennium in this way of, uh, of, of thinking about it. The millennium refers to a future period of time where Jesus will reign spiritually on earth through his church. That Christianity will spread so much around the world and have such uh, sufficient cultural power that there will be relatively just laws and relative peace on earth for an extended period of time. And then Jesus will return. Uh, the concept as sort of a unified whole as a school of thought has been around since at least the 17th century, but ideas included in it find their way back 
uh, find their way all the way back to the, to the ancient church. Okay? And names you might recognize that are at least somewhat in the post-mill camp include Jonathan Edwards, Charles Hodge, and B.B. Um, Warfield. And then we'll talk about amillennialism, and I'll, I'll, I'll just um, I'll cop uh, up front and say that this is where I sit, tentatively at least. I told you I may very well be wrong, but it's the one that makes the most sense of both Revelation and the rest of the Bible to me. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. The name is a little bit misleading because awe as a prefix means no. Uh, and so uh, it's, not that, it's not that we believe that there is no millennium. Uh, rather, uh, all millennialism says that the millennium is now. That the millennium is the period between the first and second coming of Jesus. That the millennium is the vast majority of the church age in between the first and second comings of Jesus, and that it is characterized by the limited ability of the devil to deceive the nations and the reign of deceased Christians with Jesus in heaven. There will be a short period of intensified persecution of the church, and then Jesus will return. And this way of looking at things basically traces itself back into the third century. It is also very old. Okay. All millennialism is more or less the position of, of the Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Oriental Orthodox churches. It's also very common in Lutheran, Reformed, Presbyterian, and Anglican churches. It's, the, it, it's basic ideas were taught by Augustine of Hippo and John Calvin and others. It's also the view that, as I mentioned, I think makes the most sense of both Revelation and the rest of the Bible. However, uh, I will gladly note the significant names that were attached to many of the others, and also note that their, at least their ideas, if not the system as a whole, stretches back through most of church history. And so um, these are uh, historical pre-mill, post-mill, ah-mill, these are all legitimate options for Bible-believing Christians. They can all be uh, believed in good faith, okay? But as I said, I think Amil makes the most sense of both Revelation and the rest of the Bible, and there are a few reasons for that. Personally, I have a hard time accepting the teaching of, of two different physical resurrections in premillennialism, where, um, where you have Christians raised to reign with Christ for a thousand years, and then the final resurrection at the... Uh, at the end of history. The pretty unified teaching of 1 Corinthians 15 seems to me to be of one physical resurrection at the last day. So whatever Revelation 20 seems to be describing in the first resurrection, I'm hard pressed to accept anything that would negate only one future physical resurrection. And with the New Testament's repeated exhortations to be ready for persecution, and with its lack of any direction to establish an earthly kingdom for Jesus, especially given that he says his kingdom is not of this world, I have a hard time buying into the idea of a future millennial reign of Christ that happens as an earthly kingdom or multiple earthly kingdoms through his church. Moreover, I think the amillennial reading overall meshes well with the teachings of the rest of the New Testament. Um, and I'd be... I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about that with any of you afterwards, but for now, let's consider not just how to interpret this passage, but what it means for us here and now, okay? And again, with a little bit of a, with a, little bit of a caveat, if, if Amil is the right way to read it, okay, then here is, what, here is what this passage means for us right here and now, okay? So we started with millennial overview, now let's talk about um, millennial reality here and now, since, if I'm right anyway, uh, we're in it. We are presently in the millennium and have been for almost a couple thousand years now and will be for who knows how much longer, okay? First thing is the binding of Satan, the binding of Satan. 
Um, Look what it says there at the beginning of chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. Okay. The picture is fairly clear that the devil is bound with a chain by an angel and thrown into a pit for the thousand years so that he cannot deceive the nations. Jesus says something very similar in reference to what he does uh, to the devil in both Matthew 12 and in Mark chapter 3. If you'll uh, permit me, I'll read uh, one verse there from Mark chapter 3, Mark 3.27. This is when Jesus is accused of casting out demons by the power of the devil. And he says, you'll remember from going through Luke, that doesn't make any sense. If the devil is working against himself, why would he do that, right? Um, And then he says this, if the devil is losing, if the devil is being routed, if the devil is being plundered, here's why it's happening. Mark 3, 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. And a very similar thing is repeated in Matthew 29. Jesus describes himself as the one who binds the strong man, talking about Satan, and then plunders his house. Okay? Which means that What John is telling us here in in Revelation chapter 20 is that for for much of history, for thousands of years, for the time time before Jesus, that the devil was involved in the act of deceiving the nations, of keeping people blinded to the truths of God. And we see that in the way that history worked out up until the arrival of Jesus for thousands of years. It was pretty well only one nation of people who knew the Lord, Abraham and his descendants. Only Israel and later Judah knew the Lord. There were some outliers who came to faith, some outsiders who became believers, but it was pretty well restricted to just people of the household of Abraham. Jesus is describing the other nations of the world as having been deceived by Satan such that they could not know the living God, or rather, rather, John is describing the other nations that way. And now, in Mark chapter 3, and I believe repeated here in Revelation chapter 20, there is the description of Jesus binding the devil such that he cannot deceive the nations in the same way any longer. Paul in in Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says something very similar that Jesus has disarmed the demonic powers through the cross. All of which points back to the binding and the sealing of the devil in Revelation 20 as being something that happened with the ministry of Jesus, especially his crucifixion and his resurrection. So we see the effects of the restriction of the devil's power of the binding of Satan, we see the effects of that in the world around us now. He's still there, but he is subject to the authority of Jesus. He is unable to stop the progress of the gospel. We see the effects of it in the world all around us, that that the truths of God are no longer limited to one nation or one ethnic group of people, but have been believed basically around the entire world. That doesn't mean that every single person believes, but that people from every background, every place, every family have come to see Jesus, have had the lights turned on and have have believed the gospel and become Christians. The church exists in, in pretty much every place in the world, which was not the case before the arrival of Jesus. And we have a tendency to be very pessimistic sometimes about the progress of the gospel around the world, but I think that's mainly because we see a loss of cultural power in Europe and North America, and we assume that that means that the church is failing. 
But the gospel is making tremendous gains all over the world in South America and in Africa and in Asia and even absent cultural power that it may once have had. The church continues to advance here in North America and Europe and there continue to be new people coming to faith in these places as well. The devil is not able to stop peoples from all nations of the earth from turning to Jesus in faith. So take this as an opportunity to share the good news. See that the game is on. See that the, the, the possibility of success is real. You know, we're, we're, we're planning on, on planting a new church in South Edmonton this year. And it has the express goal, not just of, of providing a new location for, you know, disaffected Christians from other churches to come and find a new church home, but of, of bringing new people to faith in Jesus. That is the intended main way that the church there will grow. And if the binding of Satan were not true, if the devil were still unhindered, able to deceive all of the nations, I mean, things like this, things like this would be foolish. It would be guaranteed to fail. It would be an exercise in vanity and in, and in futility. But because the devil is bound, because he is subject to the authority of Jesus, because he is not able to deceive the nations in the way he once did, things like this are doable and achievable. They are the sorts of things we should be pursuing for the sake of the kingdom of God because the Holy Spirit is living and active and, and because the devil is bound and is not able to prevent the spread of the good news. So pray fervently for your friends and, and your family who don't know Jesus and, and pray for the success of Mission South Edmonton. These things can and do happen precisely because Satan is bound from the time of Jesus' first coming to just prior to his second. That's the first thing. Millennial reality here and now, the first is the binding of Satan. Um, consider also what John calls the first resurrection. The first resurrection. Uh, the second half of verse 4 begins, Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Okay, John says that he saw those who had not forsaken Jesus, those who had not turned away to idolatry, those who had not bowed the knee to the beast, but those who had stayed true to Jesus. What elsewhere in Revelation, the people, what, what is referred to as, as overcoming or conquering, okay, is always staying faithful, is always persevering in the faith. He says that he saw them come to life and reign with Jesus. He's describing Christians who had persevered unto death, those who had true and saving faith. And, and he says that everyone else, that is those who were not Christians, did not come to life until the end of the thousand years. And this is, this is tricky. But if the millennium is the period of time between the first and second comings of Jesus, then what John calls the first resurrection is the presence of the souls of believers in heaven with Jesus to reign with him there until his return. And that those who are not believers do not go to heaven to exist blissfully with the Lord. Instead, they await their resurrection to everlasting judgment. So know this. Those that you know who have died in the Lord have experienced the first resurrection. That is, on the other side of death is life in the presence of the Lord. They still await the second resurrection. They await the raising of their bodies, described in 1 Corinthians 15. But they are alive, and their souls are present with Jesus. Likewise, as we await our, or as we face our own mortality in this life, we are awaiting 
the same thing. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. We call this the, the intermediate state, the way that things will be in between our embodied life here on earth before death and our embodied life on the new earth after the resurrection. What, what John is describing here is, is disembodied life as souls in the presence of the Lord. That upon death, those who belong to Jesus immediately go into his presence in heaven. And we, we live with him there as souls awaiting the second resurrection, awaiting the last day when our souls and our bodies made new will be, will be rejoined to each other. Know that death does not mean the end of your existence. And you look forward, assuming that we die before Jesus returns, we look forward to two resurrections when we belong to Jesus. The first is your living as a soul with him in glory following your death. And the second is your being raised with a new body at the last day. The millennial reality here and now, we talked about the binding of Satan and the first resurrection and now... Lastly, the heavenly reign of the saints. John described those who came to life to be with Jesus in heaven as reigning with him, as being uh, co-regents, vice-regents with him. John says that the believers who have died come to life to reign with Christ for the thousand years. Jesus Jesus went through his estate of, of humiliation, right? We, we talk about this sometimes, that Jesus had two estates. His estate of humiliation, where he became one of us. He took on a human body and a human nature. He became weak and mortal. He experienced a life filled with joy, but also pain and rejection and misery. And then, in and after his resurrection, he, he came into his estate of humiliation. He was ex uh, his estate of, uh, of glorification. He was exalted and glorified. And we follow him in the same pattern. We experience difficulty and trial in this life. And then with our resurrection, including the first resurrection to life in heaven after our death, we are glorified. We experience not exactly the same, but along with Jesus, we experience glory and, and honor in heaven and on the new earth as those who belong to him, as those who receive the same as our Lord and Master. We leave our life of suffering and pain and sickness and eventually death, and we enter a life of honor and reflected glory. We reign as princes and princesses, as it were, with King Jesus. In heaven, we receive our first taste of the glories of eternity, of what it means to reign with Christ, and we receive those things fully when we experience the second resurrection, and our bodies are raised new at Jesus' return, and we reign with him again on the new earth. Whatever trials and difficulties come in this life, know that holding fast to Jesus is greater than anything you may lose. In Christ, you are heirs of the entire world. In Christ, you shall inherit the earth. In Christ, you are vice regents of all of creation. Your present travails are real and they hurt, but they are only for a little while. For right now, because the devil has been bound and sealed and cannot deceive the nations any longer, and because the millennium has begun, and because the, the dead in Christ rise to reign with him in heaven, for right now, the gospel can go forward. The devil can work against you, but he can't stop you. With Jesus, go plunder his house. And in time, you will live with Christ in heaven when you die. You will reign with him in heaven. 
and you will be raised in the second resurrection with a body made new when Jesus returns. Hope for these things. Love because of these things. And have faith because the day is coming. Let's pray. Lord, these are heavy and yet awesome and wondrous things. And so we pray, as always, help us to respond faithfully, trusting you, following Jesus, desiring to become more like him, wanting to see the kingdom of God grow and the kingdom of Satan be plundered many new people, many more souls brought into the kingdom of God. And also let us be patient and hopeful, awaiting the day that we see Jesus face to face, knowing that we shall reign with him and holding fast to him now in faith, knowing that gaining this is greater than anything that we might lose here and now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.